Well, this morning's lectionary reading uh, in John does a funny thing. It picks up one verse in the first part of chapter 8, and then with a big leapfrog jumps over 46 verses and drops down on chapter 9 to tell the longest healing story in the Bible. But it makes perfect sense to cherry pick that uh, verse in chapter 8 because it summarizes in one verse what this long healing story in John 8 is all about. In John 8, 12, Jesus makes another one of his I am claims as he is in conversation with his adversaries. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That statement, along with others that he said and did in chapter 8, resulted in a major verbal kerfuffle, a word fight. The conversation got so heated, the religious leaders tossed Jesus one of the worst slurs they could think of, calling him a demon-possessed Samaritan. Wow. That insult covers religion, morality, mental health, and race. So the healing of the blind man happens right after all that fuss, at least in John, who seems to arrange that story in that way on purpose. Measured in number of verses, 41, no other healing story gets this much ink in the Bible. The fascinating thing about it is Jesus plays a minor role in the story. The healing itself takes up only two verses. In the rest of the chapter, there's a whole cast of characters reacting to that healing. Jesus healed the blind man on a Sabbath. And that stirred up the worst fears of the Jewish leaders that they live with every day. They couldn't stomach Jesus' popularity because it was calling unwanted attention from Roman authorities. You see, Rome was just fine with the Jewish people keeping their Jewish identity and practicing their religion just so long as they kept calm and paid their taxes on time. In other words, Rome was saying to the Jewish rulers, do your religious thing. Pretend like you have actual power, even though you don't. We don't care, just as long as you keep the peace and keep the money flowing. It was an arrangement that the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders could live with because, well, they could live with it. And because it kept some semblance of control in their hands, kept them in their jobs. But they knew if things got out of hand, the hammer would drop. So it was not entirely unreasonable of them to be concerned about Jesus and his impact on the people. If Jesus started skirting the religious law and got crowds of people on his side while he was doing it, it was undermining this convenient arrangement they had with the empire. It could affect everyone's well-being. You know, I think many Bible readers, myself included, are sometimes too quick to judge the Pharisees. As judge them as the power-hungry elite who ignore the little people and game the system to their advantage. That's not really fair. They were working on behalf of their people in at least two significant ways. They tried to maintain calm and social order to keep them out of the crosshairs of the Roman Empire. That's a good thing. And 
they were trying to achieve ritual purity around Sabbath laws and other religious regulations, not because they were fanatical, self-righteous conservatives who didn't care about the people. No, they cared about purity because they believed sincerely that the Messiah would not come and deliver them politically until they had achieved purity religiously. Now, were they misguided? Yes. But were they well-intentioned? Also, yes. So keep that in mind as we review the plot of this healing story. If you can call it a plot, it's less a sequence of actions than it is a series of debates. This would not make a great movie unless you like movies that are all talk and no action. The first conversation is between Jesus and the disciples. Before Jesus healed the man, the disciples pointed at the man, not out of compassion for him as a human being, but as a theological object lesson, asking Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus confronted their faulty theology and said, neither one. Then he proceeded to act with compassion and healed the man of his blindness. Well, that set everything into motion because, you guessed it, it was the Sabbath day. This story has multiple scenes and multiple debates over different issues. Some could just not believe that a man born blind could now see. So there was an investigation of sorts, just to verify the story, make sure it wasn't being fabricated. But the central debate here was driven by the Pharisees, who were stuck on this issue of the Sabbath. At first, the Pharisees tried to pull the man's parents into the argument, but they wouldn't take the bait. Eventually, it came down to a face-off between the Pharisees and the formerly blind man. And it's a brilliant dialogue. It probably would make a good movie, after all. The Pharisees end up looking like blustering fools and the blind beggar like a skilled orator who wins the debate with his superior intellect. There's a couple mic drop moments in this chapter. The argument came down to this crucial point. Is this man Jesus from God or is he a fraud? That's the key question. Because the buzz all over the country is this growing feeling about Jesus. This could be the Messiah. And many are starting to believe that he actually is. And things are not staying calm and quiet the way Jewish leaders need them to be. Rumblings of Messiah mean rumblings of revolt. Rome would not hesitate to clamp down. And Jesus is not once but multiple times breaking Sabbath law or encouraging others to break Sabbath law. Remember the other week, Jesus asking the lame man to carry his mat on the Sabbath, an illegal act. And Jesus is not keeping himself ritually pure, associating with lepers and sinners and Samaritan women By definition, their definition, it's impossible that Jesus could be the Messiah. The Messiah will come when religious purity is achieved. This man is drawing people away from religious purity. 
The Pharisees' entire world of constructed reality is in conflict, and they are afraid. They are afraid that this fraudster is about to ruin the whole project and bring the wrath of Rome down on everyone's head. But what this amazing gospel story does instead is unmask the Pharisees' false sense of security. It reveals the underlying fear that is driving their whole way of living, their fear of losing control over the situation. Jesus has a way of shining God's light of truth into the shadow areas of whoever he encounters. That's why John 8, 12 is the key that unlocks this healing story. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus comes shining God's spotlight on all that is wounded and broken and unjust in this world. The healing of this man would have been no big deal if he hadn't violated religious law in doing it. But these circumstances brought religious law and God's compassion into conflict with each other. That was God's spotlight. In Jesus' day, and perhaps in ours just as much, sometimes giving someone the healing or justice that they need results in the powers being unmasked for who they really are, operatives that rely on fear to maintain control. I'm guessing we could all think of some modern day examples in the larger world of political movements and social change. The powers of evil are everywhere present in our world. We can easily look to the human disaster befalling Ukraine right now, where the people of one country are in no way enemies of the people in another. Extended families find themselves on both sides of this conflict. It seems so transparent to us that Fear of losing control. Fear of a constructed reality falling apart is what's driving Putin and the Russian government to invade a neighboring country and cause so much human suffering without remorse. But you know, we can look to our own dysfunctional political system and point to where fear is a driving force all across the political spectrum, where fear is the motivator and human compassion is a forgotten virtue. Now, of course, those are easy targets. The Russian government and our own po domestic political adversaries But I think the truth of the gospel hits closer home. What fears are keeping me from following the light of Christ? Where are there shadow spaces in our own lives where we'd rather the light of God not poke around so much? Is there a way in which God wants to offer us healing and we aren't quite ready for that? Because it would disturb the status quo. Jesus is the light of the world. 
in the light of our own being. And light is sometimes welcomed and sometimes not. Light can illuminate us. Light can also disillusion us. And illusions are hard to let go of. I think that's what Jesus was getting at in that concluding debate in chapter 9. And he was talking to the formerly blind man and the Pharisees were in earshot listening in. Let me just reread the last three verses because I can't say it any clearer. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Ah, the illusion of sight even worse than blindness. In today's psalm reading, we heard these familiar words, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That question, whom shall we fear? We usually read it as a rhetorical question, and rightly so. God is light. There is no one we should fear. But actually, we don't have to read it as a rhetorical question. Whom shall we fear? Serious question. Whom do we fear? Sometimes we fear the one wielding the flashlight. 